her scream, no, stop it. I heard some gunshots. Drop it, whatever it is, drop it! That does not prove that I killed my wife. We know what happened because the video tells us what happened. The camera doesn't lie. lie, lie. This time on Killers Caught on Camera. I want to see my son! Please calm down. In the UK, a five-year-old boy goes missing in the middle of the night. If he's unconscious, he needs me. He needs he warm needs clothes. He needs, he needs mum. He needs his clothes. As police desperately search for answers. Focus! Was he dead or alive? Was he in danger? Or had he been taken by someone? And in South Africa, a woman is found dead in a field. There's going to be a point of time where she realizes that they don't intend to, to let her live. As law enforcement pieced together the 11-hour carjacking that resulted in her death. One of the assailants tells him, quiet or she dies. Bridgend, Wales. Logan Wangi was a five-year-old boy who lived with his mother, Angharad Williamson, and stepfather, John Cole. He was a very happy, polite, chatty young boy, a little bit cheeky, but was very sort of affectionate and just had a real thirst for learning. Everyone who came into contact with him just thought he was a really lovely little boy. 5.45 a.m. 31st of July, 2021. A frantic 999 call was made. Please, please help me, please. Where are you? My son, but no, he's not here. There's someone, he's not here. Okay. Who's not there? My son, he's five, he's not here. Oh, when did you see him last? I sent him in the bed last night and I've just got up for my son and he's the other one joined here. Logan! Philip Dewey is court correspondent for Wales Online. She woke up that morning, had gone into Logan's room, and he had disappeared. She said she checked the back door and it was open, but Logan hadn't taken his shoes or a coat. She said she was absolutely petrified that he, he had left the house, was somewhere cold and afraid. After Angharad called 999, John and his 13-year-old stepson, Craig, searched the neighborhood as captured on a home surveillance system. Within sort of 10 minutes, police officers were on the ground looking everywhere, everywhere that Logan might have gone to, friends and neighbors. And John and Craig were out looking for Logan as well. What's your partner's name, sorry? Anne Harrod. My, my boss is up with Anne Harrod. What's your name, buddy? Craig. How, are you, how old are you, Craig? 13. 13? Is he okay? I, I, I honestly don't know. We'll, we'll go this way, come on. The police needed to get as much information as possible from the family. Officers asked them to go back to the house. We'll talk to you up the house. Go on. Is he okay? I don't know. A police body cam filmed Ang Harrod distraught on the doorstep. Ang Harrod was very upset, as any mother would be in that situation. It was just about finding out what had happened to Logan. If he's unconscious, he needs me. He needs he warm needs clothes. He needs mum. He needs his okay. Is Logan okay? I don't know, buddy. I, I don't. I'm sorry. Kirsty Bennett is a criminal psychologist. When we initially have a child disappearing, our first concern is obviously where is that child? and what's happened to them. And to do that, we have to cooperate with the family who are gonna be able to give us ideas about where Logan might be. Has he got a father? <laughs> Biological father's in London. Oh, okay. I want to see my Please. son! Please calm down. Please calm down. They had a mother who was beside herself with worry and they were having to deal with that aspect of, the, of trying to reassure her and calm her down. I feel so useless though. Not knowing what happened to this little boy, there was a whole sort of range of possibilities about what they were facing. Like, was he, was he dead or alive? Was he in danger? Or had he been taken by someone? 
These were all sort of questions that were still yet to be answered and the investigation to find out what happened to him was critical in those, in those stages. It's not my fault. Less than an hour after Logan went missing, police located him just a few hundred meters from the family home. Two police officers were searching in, in nearby Pandy Park uh, along the River Ogmore when at the corner of one of the officer's eye they saw what looked like a body floating in the River Ogmore. Uh, at that point, one of the officers dived in, got into the river and retrieved the body. Uh, and it, it was quite apparent from the descriptions that, th that this was Logan. Logan was pronounced dead at the scene. Angharad was given the devastating news. Where is Logan? Where is Logan, He's please? Still... What happened to him? The police's initial impressions about what had happened to Logan, obviously it looked like he had wandered into the river and had drowned. There was a lot of unanswered questions, obviously about how he had come to be in the river, how he had left the house and police were keeping an open mind at this stage. His body was taken to hospital and was then sent for a post-mortem shortly later. While the family were dealing with Logan's death, investigators got to work piecing together what happened. They started with a key piece of body-worn footage recorded at the house when the police first arrived. I don't know. Right now, the best thing... All I'm getting is answers like this. Why is no one telling me what's going on? I don't on? know. <laughs> Coral Dando is a professor of forensic psychology. She used to be a police officer and understands detective work. They are very good at what we refer to as situational awareness. So they'll walk into a situation or a context and be very cognizant, very aware of what's going on. So they don't necessarily acknowledge it, but it will have all, you know, been taken in. What we actually see on the body-worn camera is the washing machine going off. And that's a bit concerning because if they're asleep and they've woken up to find Logan missing, your first thought wouldn't be to put the washing machine on. Unusual behaviour when your child's missing and you're absolutely traumatised, you're grief-stricken, you're hysterical. The contents of the washing machine raised more questions. When police looked inside the washing machine that there was bedding uh, that belonged to Logan that was being washed. Their story wasn't adding up but the police still needed more evidence. They spoke to a number of neighbours to see if they had CCTV cameras on their property that could be used to see how Logan had left the house, whether he had left on his own or whether there had been another explanation as to how he came to be in the river. Emmy Polito is an expert witness and video analyst. Luckily, the police finds a CCTV footage of a neighbouring property pointing directly at Logan's bedroom. Dr. Vasilius Karagianopoulos is a leading figure in digital forensics. There is light turning on in Logan's room during the night on multiple occasions, and it stays on for many minutes. Ang Harrod told police she went to bed and slept all night. This footage suggests that there are people awake and not asleep in bed. Someone had been busy. Looking at the CCTV, they find out that something else is going on. Two figures were seen leaving from the back of the house in the middle of the night. They appeared to be carrying something over their shoulder and walking up the garden path and then walking in the direction of the river. At the same time, we can actually see someone opening the curtains in Logan's bedroom. Given that Logan's mum account was that she's been asleep all night and there was no activity in the property during the night, clearly the police have now information to suspect that something more sinister is going on. Detectives wanted to re-examine the 999 call made by Ang Harrod. The CCTV in the daylight now shows Logan's mum coming out of the property, making the 999 call. Please, please help me! 
please. Where are you? <laughs> My son and I know here. There's quite an emotional response from Logan's mum, which we would normally anticipate, but she's not really crying. Oh, Take, a breath. Take a breath. Take a breath. Obviously, the operator was trying to reassure her, but she was having having none of it. And it's very hard to pin her down and get her to to engage with the police. I know that this is terrifying. <laughs> right now, I need to scream so I can get the information I need. It starts to raise suspicions as to why she's not given the information being asked of her when she's so concerned about her child being missing. Where does the back gate lead it to be to? I don't know what the road's called. That's it's fine. It leads onto a road as opposed to a field or anything like that, does it? Obviously, the operator was professional and trying to cope with the situation, but there just seemed to be something very melodramatic about the way she was acting and possibly not quite ringing true. The time of the day is quite interesting as well because Logan's five years old. You wouldn't expect him to voluntarily leave the house during those hours. And because of that time, we'd like to think the house is secure, it's locked, he wouldn't have access to leave the property. And that wouldn't immediately raise suspicions at 5.40 in the morning that a five-year-old boy has seemingly wandered out of the house. As suspicions grew, the police had another look at the footage of John and Craig out searching for Logan. People will go incredibly far to try and cover up their crimes, and search parties are not irregular, pretending to look for them, pretending to be distraught. All of these can be a package of that sort of deceptive narrative you're trying to spin, where you're trying to convince other people that you had nothing to do with this, and you're just an innocent parent who's looking for their loved one. He's unconscious! Why is he unconscious? The footage in the kitchen became increasingly important. I don't know. I don't know. So when police arrive at these sort of situations, they have to tread a really complex path because they have no idea whether the, on this occasion, Anne Harrod, so Logan's mother, is actually telling the truth or whether she is acting out a trauma response or a grief response to the terrible news that her child is missing. So they have to be really careful. They want to gather information from her. And in order to do that, they need to just let her talk. Because at this point, there is no concept or no understanding that he is actually dead. There are elements about her behavior that you can see on the uh, body-worn camera footage that are quite interesting to psychologists such as myself. He There's needs mum. He needs his She's screeching, she's howling, she's saying an awful lot. I feel so useless, though. I know. But there are no details, there's no real information, there's nothing that the police officers can really use in terms of trying to seek out where Logan is. This is all my fault. Are there any verifiable details in her account? And there are very few. But of course, in a trauma response, that might well be the case. So it's really difficult. And she's also dropping down to her knees in a traumatic behavioral sort of way, which I think she thinks is how a parent in her situation should behave. Oh, I'm not allowed to see my own biological son. You'd expect a mother to be upset and e even even quite hysterical, but this was something sort of something different. What is going on? Look at me. Focus, focus, focus. At one minute, she was wailing, crying for her baby. Uh, next minute, she was acting aggressively towards officers. Next minute, she seemed to be in denial. I want to see my Please, son! Calm down. Please calm down. <laughs> People who feel like they're not able to mask their true emotions enough or not show the right emotion enough, so they don't look sad enough, they don't look concerned enough. You get someone leaning more and more and more and almost becoming more and more theatrical and more and more obvious, even though what they're trying to do is the opposite. Investigators concluded that the nighttime footage of the two figures leaving the house at 2.43 a.m were John and Craig who carried Logan's body to the river. 
A minute later, in Logan's bedroom, it was Ang Harad who turned the light on and off and opened the curtains. It was enough to implicate all three in Logan's death. The 1st of August, 2021. You're under suspicion of me, is that okay? I haven't done anything okay. wrong! Okay. okay. When the police officer starts to arrest her, she turns from being grief-stricken, hysterical, to then starting to lash out verbally at the police officer. How can you think this is me? How can you even assume that I've anything to do with my beautiful child's death? And so on and so forth. So we get a switch straight away. What happened to him? Can't explain anything further at the moment. Why is nobody talking to me? You're supposed to be helping find out what happened, not arresting me when I'm telling you my son. Okay. She's pointing, she's shouting, and this behaviour suggests that she's now in panic mode. What is wrong with you guys? You're supposed okay. to be helping me. Had, I understand you're upset. I understand. Is your son dead? Is your son being okay, found in a river? Okay, I'm Harrod. What she's now is really, really cross. We understand you're very upset. We want to investigate. I'm very upset. I've just lost my son. She's being quite aggressive. She realises that it's all failed. It's all coming down behind her. Don't take my children no. off. It's very self-preservation. She's very concerned about what's going to happen to her and her involvement in it, rather than Logan and the circumstances surrounding his murder. Well, I'm not allowed to see my own biological son. One of the really interesting things that emerges from uh, the footage is um, this clear performative grief. I know, sit by now. I'm just sit down. I'm not doing anything wrong. She listens to what's being said, and then it kicks off again. It all starts again. Ang Harrod couldn't have acted without John Cole. I'm arresting on suspicion of a murder broken. What? This police officer here is involved in, in the arrest procedure. He will be talking, watching, gathering information. What? Oh. Hey, drop. I'm done. <clears throat> what am I doing now? I'm dead. I was just found out myself. He's happy to provide a story which seems to, to be well practiced. John's 13 year old stepson, Craig, was also taken into custody. A rational suspicion of murder of Logan Mulhanger, all right? Uh, here, come to light about you telling a witness they wanted to kill Logan. While in foster care, he told his foster family that he wanted to kill Logan, who he referred to as the five year old. There's also further CCTV evidence and information from other witnesses to speak to you about today. That's why you need to be arrested today. Here we have body cam footage of Craig and Harrod's boyfriend's stepson being arrested. He just stands there with his hands in his pockets. He says and does nothing at this point. I'm under arrest. She's doing she told me. I'm out of it. have done nothing wrong. I know. Get the out of my hey, way. Hey, come on now. I'm not messy. The fact that a 13-year-old boy was capable of taking part in such a brutal act was just something that no one would ever have expected. When you're 13 years old, you literally don't have the full-size brain that you will have later on in life. And you are going to make worse decisions overall because you don't have as much brain. So holding children, who especially are that young, as responsible as adults is always one of those tricky things to do. And in most parts of the world, we don't. But then we sometimes make exceptions, especially for extreme things like murder, because we assume even young kids can understand the consequences of something that extreme. We can never point to a single difference between someone who kills people and someone who doesn't, but we can look at the risk factors, and in his case, he had lots of them. He had an unstable environment growing up. He had callous and emotional traits. He seemed to struggle to adjust into families and to be part of the family unit. He then was moved into another high-risk situation. There's just a whole series of things going wrong here for this kid to mature in a normal, healthy way. The results of the autopsy on Logan revealed the extent of what he endured in his home. He had suffered 56 injuries. Among the injuries found on Logan's body was uh, a serious injuries to his abdomen, which had caused 
a large amount of blood loss and there was two brain injuries which had been caused by blunt force impact in the days leading up to his death. One doctor said that these sort of injuries were normally seen in people who had fallen from a great height or in a high velocity uh, car crash. Further research revealed the fatal injury was a culmination to months of suffering. Logan unfortunately has a history of abuse within the family. People have come forward who know the family, have recounted this abuse. About a year before Logan's death, he was taken to hospital by Ang Harrod, uh, who believed he was suffering a dislocated shoulder. In fact, he had uh, fractured one of his bones and was in severe pain. Ang Harrod later told police that she had popped uh, Logan's shoulder back into place after he had fallen down the stairs and sent him to bed with Calpol. It was also revealed that a lack of communication with social services resulted in a series of missed chances to protect Logan. John Cole had a bit of a checkered past. Um, he had convictions for petty crime like robbery and burglary and battery. Because of Cole's previous convictions, social services became involved with Logan. He had his own social worker who sort of was looking in on the family. In the same month that Logan was murdered, social services made one of their regular checks on the family. When social services went to visit Logan at home in July, he had contracted COVID, so he was isolated and didn't get to see him, weren't able to visit, visibly check that he was OK. We should have had some concern about how is he, what's going on with him. While well, they described Ang Harrod as overbearing, they. They believed that she loved her child and cared for him. At first, suspicious of John and his demeanour, they, they came to trust him. Eventually, uh, Logan's case was downgraded and there was no longer a need for as, as much monitoring as there had been previously. Shortly after the visit from social services, Ang Harrod and John applied for custody of John's stepson, Craig. Like John, he also had a troubled past. Craig became involved with social services after he was assaulted by his biological mother, who was then sectioned under the Mental Health Act. He had been in a number of uh, foster families and in care. Craig had a history within social services for quite inappropriate, violent behaviour and attitudes towards his foster carers. He wanted to play murder games with his foster sisters. He had been torturing the family pet and the carers were quite concerned about how that behavior was manifesting. Playing really violent games and fantasizing about murder or talking about murder, those are the kinds of things in a 13-year-old that can be indicative of something called conduct disorder, which is what we call kids who sometimes go on to become psychopaths or develop psychopathy. When you don't really feel the same emotions as other kids, especially empathy. Four out of five of the kids who have those symptoms will grow out of them. And one out of five won't. John and Anne Harrod were applying for full custody of Craig. And despite Cole's previous convictions and Craig's uh, complex needs, he was granted custody of Craig. Five days later, Logan was murdered. John Cole was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 29 years. Ang Howard Williamson was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 28 years. More disturbing facts came out in the trial about how Logan was treated by Ang Howard and John Cole when he was in their care. Logan was made to do press-ups when he was naughty and that John Cole would sit over him and make sure he completed a number of exercises in order to punish him. He was also denied food when, when the family were having a, a KFC. He, because of his behaviour, he was told he wasn't allowed to have food and was just given a bowl of cereal to eat. Neighbours also described seeing Logan uh, being made to stand outside in the, in the cold with no shoes on as punishment. And at one point, the social worker discovered that there was a burn on his neck. The reason given for this was that he'd burned it on a hot bath tap, but Cole later uh, claimed that Ang Harrod had placed a hot coffee spoon on his neck. 
And in my opinion, there wasn't a shred of remorse between them. And Howard Williamson continued to be self-pitying and maintained her innocence while John Cole pathetically looked at the floor and, and claimed that he had nothing to do with Logan's death. And Mulligan was sentenced to life detention in the Unoffenders Institute with a minimum of 15 years. Usually anonymity is maintained for children because there is this assumption that the things that you do in your childhood are going to be different than the adult you're going to grow into. And you shouldn't have to carry that baggage with you forever because of bad decisions you made with a brain that wasn't fully developed in the circumstances where you were a dependent, where society is really supposed to be taking care of you. And so your failures are reflecting on us as society, not just on you as the child. And so the fact that anonymity is waived is usually because it's seen as to be so much in the public interest and it's balanced against the rest of the kid. And it's seen as more important that the, the society knows who this person is than it is that the kid is protected, which is really tricky. The CCTV footage in this case was the main evidence which led to the convictions of the three murderers. Without that, we would never have known how Logan left the house, whether he left of his own accord or whether the truth of what happened that he had been murdered inside the house and his body discarded by his uh, stepfather and stepbrother. Again, the, the footage of Ang Harrod's behavior as well was also crucial. Um, it showed that this was not a mother who was scared for her child. It was someone who was taking part in an, an elaborate performance to cover up what had actually happened. When news of Logan's death broke out in the village where he lived and, and, and went to school, the reaction was one of complete horror. The fact that a young, innocent five-year-old child had been found dead in the river was horrifying enough. But to think that three people had been arrested on suspicion of his murder was absolutely horrifying for members of the community. The abuse and treatment experienced by Logan in the months leading up to his death must have been absolutely horrific. He was a young, small, innocent boy who was being abused and mistreated by the very two people who were meant to love and protect him and provide a safe home for him. And he was given anything but that. He must have lived a very lonely and painful existence during that time. He'll never be forgotten by the community as a very sweet young boy who just met the most horrendous end at the hands of those who should have loved him and cared for him. Almost every crime now contains some kind of digital fingerprint. Particularly for homicide investigations, the inclusion of video footage is considered the gold standard. Local law enforcement agencies often rely on home security, business and street cameras to catch offenders who would otherwise get away with it. Stellenbosch, South Africa. 2017. Aaron Hyman is a journalist for The Times and Sunday Times in the Western Cape. A very typical small student town. You have these mountains all around you, these rolling hills with vineyards, just this perfectly quaint little town. It was also home to 21-year-old Hannah Cornelius. Hannah Cornelius was a young student at uh, the University of Stellenbosch. She was a wonderful, soft, loving person to her friends and everybody that she knew. Kirsty Bennett is a criminal psychologist. Hannah was described by family and friends as a very empathetic, compassionate young woman. Hannah had many friends, including Cheslin Marsh. He was studying theology, also just a young, carefree man, you know, trying to get through his studies and enjoying, enjoying life as a, as a young student. 27th of May, 6 a.m. A couple woke up to the sound of someone in distress. The owners of the house came out, um, saw that this young man was in incredible distress and bleeding. It was Cheslin Marsh. He had gaping wounds on his head. He was in a terrible, traumatic and emotional state. They called the police. 
Cheslin explained that he and Hannah had been kidnapped in her car by three men. Hannah, as a student, had a blue VW Golf that she had inherited from her grandmother. He described Hannah's vehicle, so the blue city Volkswagen, and he described his, his four attackers. Cheslin told them that Hannah was still missing. But the police already had information about a young woman. She was found at 6.30 a.m. on Saturday, the 27th of May, by workers at a nearby farm. She had been declared dead at the scene. She was found face down and with severe wounds to her head and uh, stab wounds to the back of her neck. With Cheslin's help, the body was quickly identified as Hannah. Cheslin told the police about the traumatic events of the night before. Friday nights in Stellenbosch, it's bubbly, it's buzzing. They'd been out dancing, they'd been playing dominoes, they'd been out for quite a while having a nice time. Quite early in the morning, Hannah and Cheslin had left the local bar, got into the car, and Hannah had actually offered to drop Cheslin back at his home. The two of them parked in a parking lot. Police looked at CCTV footage from the night before. You can clearly see this Volkswagen hatchback standing there. Hannah and Cheslin are in the vehicle at this point. Emmy Polito is an expert witness and video analyst. Four individuals are walking towards the camera. We can start identifying them in the sense that potentially we are looking at four males here. We can even get to the point where we can talk a little bit about their clothing ensemble and what they're wearing. They appear to come back into view from a different direction. You can see the men looking at the car while they're walking past it as though they're scoping it out. What is it that these guys are doing at this time in the morning? You can see the men basically approach the car from two directions, both from the driver's side where Hannah Cornelius was sitting and from the passenger's side. The driver seat window was slightly open. Thrusts a hand through, gripping a screwdriver. And he puts the, the screwdriver with the sharp end pointed at her chest. Cheslin then tries to grab the screwdriver. Um, and at, at that point, another assailant gets into the back seat of the car and opens a flick knife and points it as, at Cheslin. One of the assailants tells him, quiet or she dies. I'm seeing random flashes of light, which are suspicious to me in terms of, could this be some request for help? Hannah is pleading with them and telling them, please take whatever you want, um, and, but please let us go. At that point, one of the men walks away, presumably with some of the stolen goods, and the rest of the three men put Hannah in between the two front seats, and Cheslin is in the back seat with one of the other assailants who is armed, and then they drive off. The assailants reassured Cheslin and Hannah that they just needed their car. They just want to drive somewhere, and then they're going to drop them off, and they'll be let go. Everything will, will be fine. The next time we see Hannah is about seven kilometers outside of Stellenbosch on sort of a rural back road running in between farmland. It's quite a quiet place. Cheslin told police that they stopped at a gas station. Detectives sourced the CCTV footage and found the blue Volkswagen pulling in at 4.34 a.m. We're seeing a passenger uh, occupying the passenger seat. Well, I think it would be quite reasonable to assume that this is Hannah. Between the time that they left Stellenbosch 
and the time that they arrived at the gas station, the hijackers had taken Chesan out of the car and put him in the boot. One of the hijackers then gets out of the vehicle and at this point he's got uh, Cheslin's bank card. He then walks to the ATM and he attempts to draw cash inside a shop at the gas station. This is now a considerable amount of time where this person is attempting to withdraw money out of the ATM and I'm seeing different screens flashing and fingers doing all sorts of things on that keyboard. It, it kind of appears to be leaving the scene deflated and, and disappointed. Cheslin gave the hijackers the wrong pin code to his bank card, presumably to buy time for them, or um, perhaps he just didn't want them to, to steal his money. This CCTV footage is the last time that Hannah was captured alive. It's clear at this point that the men are becoming more volatile, more irate. They are angry and aggressive with Cheslin. They take him to a sort of a forested area. They force him out of the boot of the vehicle and order him to lay his head down on a hard surface on a rock. And two men come and stand over him with bricks broken in half and at that moment he closes his eyes and he prays and that's the last thing he can remember. When they get back into the vehicle, Hannah is there with three men who had taken her. There's going to be a point of time where she realises that they don't intend to, to let her live and, and she is going to die. The men drove Hannah into some farmland where she was sexually assaulted. When we look at certain crimes, we may not have had the specific intention of, of committing such awful acts like rape or murder, but sometimes we work on the opportunity that it's, it's there, it's available, we have a victim that we can offend against. It's going to be really hard to decide not to take part because you run the risk of losing your position in the gang, maybe not being trusted by your peers. So once that decision's made, you've really got to go with, with what everybody else is doing. From there, they took a large rock and they put her head on the floor and they crushed her head with this rock twice and then they stabbed her in the back of her neck to make sure that she was dead. Hannah's body was found and reported a few hours later, but the three men did not stop there. The men drive around, they smoke drugs. They then kidnap another woman and take her bank card from her, drive her to a petrol station, and attempt to draw money. She is in the back of the car when two of the offenders get out and they withdraw 3,000 rand from her account. They look like they're just going on about their normal day, going into the station, withdrawing money. They don't look agitated, they look very calm. They look like they've been doing it for a long time and they're comfortable with it. It doesn't look like they are improvising or panicking, just normal business for them. It shows the lack of remorse and lack of emotional attachment or even uh, understanding what just has happened. They drop her off and release her and then drive back towards Stellenbosch. Police issued a be on the lookout for the blue Volkswagen and three men. Police detect a vehicle driving along a road near Stellenbosch, actually spots the blue Volkswagen Golf and starts pursuing it, leading to a high-speed car chase. The detectives pursue them and chase them down a farm road. These people have got no intention of stopping. They don't care about the damage or hurt that they leave behind. 
they basically reach a dead end and the men jump out of the vehicle. You can see the detectives chasing two men. At that stage, one of the men had already been dropped off and the detectives then apprehend both men as they try to flee into a riverbed. The two men were identified as Geraldo Parsons and Vernon Whitboy. They are taken in for questioning and the police then find out that these two men had been to prison. Um, they have a criminal history and they are part of a prominent uh, South African gang. The third man was identified as Aben van Neekerk. A fourth man, Nashville Julius, was also arrested for taking part in the initial carjacking. Vernon and Nashville gave confessions because the police had convinced them that their friends were talking and the police had convinced them that they had credible cases against them. Those men are just viewing her as an object. She means nothing to them. And there's no concern on their behalf about how she feels, how she is experienced in that moment, because it's about their own gain and gratification. It's about October 2018, when the trial starts in the Cape Town High Court. Their demeanor in court was stoic. They would often smirk and laugh. And when Chisholm had to testify, they tried to intimidate him in the witness stand. The four men were not really taking things very seriously. They were laughing, joking amongst themselves. We don't really see them showing any remorse for the various crimes that they've committed. For the family, that's horrific to, to know that how they treated their daughter in her last moments was awful, and they think it's a joke. The three main perpetrators, Geraldo Parsons, Aben van Neekerk, and Vernon Whitboy were given life sentences. They will spend 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Nashville Julius was sentenced to 15 years. CCTV footage was crucially important in this case. Without it, they might not have been able to piece together some of the key details that basically tied the men to the crimes and they might even not have been able to verify Cheslin's um, testimony. Cheslin Marsh was left deaf in one ear. It's probably one of the only positives of this whole story is that Cheslin miraculously survived and that he went on to live a life. Um, he's studying law, um, he's married, he's got kids. It must take incredible strength for a person to ever recover from something like that. Hannah's family was left with a lifetime of grief. Hannah's mother started the Hannah Cornelius Foundation in a nearby underprivileged community which helps with early childhood development for street kids and kids that come out of uh, difficult household situations. A year later, more tragedy for Hannah's family when her mother went for a swim in the ocean. She was swept out at sea and drowned, but there's also others who suspect that maybe the psychological toll was too much for her and that she might have taken her own life. The murder of Hannah Cornelius had a big impact on South African society. Out of all the women, and especially young women, children, who were being raped and murdered in South Africa. Hannah's case was, I think, particularly shocking in its brutality. There were a lot of conversations afterwards about women's rights in South Africa about how violent we are as a society, about how patriarchal our society is, how men view women. And I think there were 
there was a lot of reflection from South African society. I think the courts and the police were sensitized to these sorts of cases. There was a lot of public outpouring. Uh, I remember when they were sentenced, the gallery was full of uh, people who had just come to watch the case. And they cried out in joy, but also, uh, I guess, in anger. The positives, I guess, is the fact that we started confronting, as a society, the underlying problems that lead to men going through the criminal justice system and coming out of the criminal justice system after having served time for the same crimes that they would later commit again. But we still have so many lessons to learn from that because after that, there were so many other women who were raped and killed in South Africa.